Hi there. Are you someone who's often worried about the rapid changes taking place in the environment? Because I sure am. My name's Brett, and you're listening to 21st Century Vitalism. This is a podcast exploring how we can best stay inspired, energized, and wakeful while dealing with the somewhat stormy waters of this current time in history. To do this, I think it's important to grapple with the reality of climate change and the rampant ecological collapse that we're facing. The thing is, whether we're actively acknowledging this or not, it is having an effect on us. Many people will try to bury their heads in the sand, but we're really seeing the signs all around us. Mass extinction, rising temperatures, more chaotic weather patterns. All of these things have been creating a specific and subtle tension within our awareness that when left unaddressed can create a palpable anxiety and fear. With that said, I think it's imperative that those of us undertaking this journey of cultivating vitality really address the situation. Not only should we address it, but we should learn how to act in a way that generates hope. For without that, how could we possibly imagine a future that's worth living in? I know, I know. You're probably thinking, how the heck can we be hopeful when the situation seems so dire? Well, luckily, today's guest has some solutions that I believe hold the key to restoring not only the land we're stewarding, but also our place in it as fellow terrestrial beings with a shared destiny. Enter Professor Doug Tallamy of the University of Delaware, who has dedicated the past 41 years of his life to studying and teaching conservation, entomology, and wildlife ecology. He's authored 106 research publications and released four books, including the one on today's topic, New York Times best-selling Nature's Best Hope. In this conversation, Doug is going to explain to us the overlooked problem of biodiversity loss and what we can do on an individual basis to address it. He explains how conservation is an individual's responsibility, and it's actually quite accessible. Not only is it accessible, but it's a deeply rewarding process which can heal not only the land, but also ourselves. So we're going to learn some simple but powerful conservation principles that allows us to have an opportunity to transform our yards into a life-sustaining refuge for our local ecosystem. Sounds pretty good, right? Before we get into that, though, I do want to point your attention over to his nonprofit, Homegrown National Park, which is an amazing organization that's seeking to distill a lot of these principles into actionable steps that you yourself can start incorporating into your yards. It's a really beautiful system that you're going to be hearing about in this conversation, and that is the project that is helping really spread these ideas. So head on over to homegrownnationalpark.org and check out some of the stuff. Alternatively, uh, you can also get his book, Nature's Best Hope. It's wherever books can be found. I just read it earlier this year and was absolutely blown away. I had a couple weeks where I was thinking about quitting my massage practice and just going full on into ecology. And I'm like, wait, that might not be my role. But it is deeply inspiring and profound and really leaves you with a sense of hope, which is so hard to come by. Uh, If you want to support this show, you can head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook. I always screw all that up, but that's what you can do to help out. We also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash 21st Century Vitalism. Get on board and uh, yeah, let's help keep this ship a moving. So that's what we're going to be doing today, y'all. It is a juicy episode. If you have a pen and a notepad, please feel free to bring it out because there's a lot of really important tidbits. If you own property, this is going to be so good for you to absorb and to contemplate and to think. So I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I encourage you to sit back, maybe do some stretches, maybe drink some tea, but most definitely open your hearts for Dr. Doug Tallamy. Okay, Doug, we are now live. Uh, Welcome to 21st Century Vitalism. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. I'm very appreciative. I am happy to be here. Yeah. 
So uh, I recently had the pleasure of going through your newest book, uh, which I have right here, Nature's Best Hope, New York Times bestseller. Congratulations. Um, and I just wanted to really say that I was left feeling deeply inspired by this work. Um, and not only inspired, but also it left me with a sense of eagerness and this notion of workability when it comes to facing uh, climate change. And that is something that I find to be just so rare when we're talking about mass ecosystem collapse. For a work to be able to instill a sense of optimism, uh, I think is just vitally important. No pun intended with the name of the show. So I really wanted to have this conversation, invite my listeners into this world, because I wasn't really someone who was plugged into conservationalism. And this book literally makes me want to get involved. Um, so yeah, I guess to just start off, I want to ask you very broadly in the face of climate change and this worry we all share, what is nature's best hope? That's an easy one. You are nature's best hope. Everybody is nature's best hope. Um, so the, the book is designed, first of all, we have... We have climate change issues, but we've got biodiversity loss issues too. And if we had no climate change, we would still have biodiversity loss because we are not sharing the planet with the nature that supports us. So these are two, two simultaneous crises. If we work on solving the biodiversity crisis, we are also uh, working towards uh, helping climate change because it's plants really that are going to pull carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then fix that carbon uh, into plant tissues, but even more important, plant tissues, plants pump carbon dioxide into the ground through their root systems 24-7, all kinds of plants, but the bigger the plant, the better. And that's uh, that gets the carbon into the ground for long-term storage. So, uh, you know, our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. So who's going to put the plants back? I mean, who took the plants away? We all did uh, on a little individual basis here and there. We're still doing that. We have we have uh, fewer than half of the forests that once covered the earth remain. Uh, but if you just think about the piece of the earth that you could influence, and if you own property, that's that's where you start. Um, that's your responsibility. So when I say you are nature's best hope, I didn't say we've solved the problem. I just say the hope. Uh, the responsibility lies with the millions and millions of people on this planet who have to um, assume the responsibility of taking care of the ecosystems that, that we depend on. We've had this very strange situation in the past where, you know, we train a few specialists, ecologists and conservation biologists, and everybody else has the green light to destroy the planet. That makes no sense at all. Um, everybody depends on healthy ecosystems, so absolutely everybody, whether you're a tree hugger or not, whether you live in a city or not, has the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems. So when I say your nature's best hope, um, that's exactly what I mean, uh, but it means you have to you have to follow through. We can't just talk about it. We, we need to actually take action. It is a grassroots solution to these two major environmental problems. So, you know, as some people are hearing you say this and then they look out their window and they see trees and they see the garden they planted with all the lovely plants they got from the store, they might say to themselves like, well, I'm doing my job. I got, you know, I got plants like, so is that it? Do I just cash out? And so <laughs> what exactly from the modern uh, way we've been navigating our yard spaces is a problem and what do we need to like work on to meet? what you're sharing? Well, the ecosystems we're trying to reestablish are, are functional communities with all kinds of interacting members. And uh, these are members that essentially co-evolve together. They all have different jobs, uh, but these are jobs that work their, their, um, their relationships out over eons together. The, the, when you look at your window and you look at the landscape you've created, chances are really good, like at least 80%, that the trees you're looking at are not native. They're from Asia or they're from some other place. <clears throat> the bushes are from some other place. You've got uh, your, your yard is dominated by lawn. 
Um, those are that's just a hodgepodge of species we've put back, none of which evolved together. So none of which are doing the ecological roles that a an established native plant based community used to do. There are four things that every landscape has to accomplish if we're going to reach a sustainable relationship with with Mother Earth, and we do need to do that. Has to support pollinators, not not for agriculture. We hear that all the time, but 80% of our plants. Uh, are pollinated by animals, and and 90% of the flowering plants depend on on pollinators. And it's you know, you know people say I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need pollinators. Well, that's not true. You know, we we need pollinators every place we need plants, which is every place, and that includes your yard. So your yard has to support pollinators. That has to support a viable food web. So you have to have plants that are willing to pass on the energy they they capture from the sun. All plants are photosynthesizing, and they're turning the energy from the sun into food. Well, that food uh, is what supports all the animals on the planet, but only if it gets to those animals. And that's the problem with, with plants from other continents. They're very poor at passing their energy on. The plant needs to be eaten in order for that energy to get up into the food web. Uh, so who's, who's eating most of the plants? It's actually insects, and then vertebrates eat the insects. So if you have plants and you look at the leaves and there's nothing eaten out of those leaves. It means none of that energy has been transferred to insects, so the birds have no caterpillars to eat or, or um, uh, any other insects that keep our food webs going. So we need to use plants that are willing to support a food web. We need to use plants that are going to sequester as much carbon as possible. So I'm picturing big oak trees, you know, that live 900 years. And these, these are real contributors to climate change. And we also have to use plants that are going to manage the watershed. So those are the four things, pollinators, food web, carbon, and, and watershed management. If your landscape isn't doing all of those things, then we need to, to work on, on fixing it. And chances are, when I, you know, when I look out the window, when I look out the window of my building here, or when I drive down the street, um, most of the landscapes we have out there were designed with one purpose in mind, and that was to be pretty. It was not focused on any one of the four things that I just mentioned. So the real goal today in landscaping is how do we make pretty, plant, pretty yards that are ecologically functional too? Uh, and it all resolves around, revolves around plant choice. We can do that if we choose the right plants and if we use more of them. How could we learn what are the right plants? I'm sure some people are hearing that and like, oh, it sounds like he wants me to learn things. Like, I don't even, I don't know if I have the spoons to become an <laughs> ecologist. No, no, you don't have to do that. Uh, all right, so what are the right plants? You know, if we're going to support pollinators, there are plants that are best at doing that. If we're going to sequest carbon, there are plants that are best at doing that. All of this is, is online at this point. Uh, there's a tool on the National Wildlife Federation website called Native Plant Finder. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of the best plants, uh, both woody plants and herbaceous plants, in your county will pop up for you. So there it is. Boom. It's right right there. Um, there's another another tool called um, Keystone Plants by Eco Region, which gives you the best uh, plants for specialist pollinators. When we're making pollinator gardens, we want to address the needs of specialist pollinators, the ones that need particular plants, because the generalist pollinators can use those plants too, mm. and you can get those those uh, species from from that website. Uh, so yeah, I, I understand it. Most people are not trained ecologists. Most people don't garden at all. They hire somebody. So we're really looking at a, a career opportunity here. We don't have nearly enough people who can call themselves ecological gardeners or ecological landscapers. So that the, you know, particularly young folks, they've got the kids, soccer moms, everything else, they, they don't have time to be out planting trees, so they hire somebody. Today, it's usually the mow, blow, and go guys that, that um, are all about just making it neat and biologically dead. Uh, so we'll, we'll retrain those people or we'll hire other people and you don't have to worry about it. Just hire somebody and they'll, they'll, they'll install the right plants. They'll take care of them and it'll be wonderful. So, you know, I feel like the general consensus with stuff like this is often like, well, like, I don't really want to do this. I mean, we have these national parks that, like, we invest our tax dollars into. Like, is that not enough to just create a space over there that, you know, I don't have, I have my lawn, I have my yard, I don't have to challenge any status quo. Nature's over there. I'm over here. Like, it, 
it, that's just not enough, right? Well, if it were enough, we wouldn't be in the sixth great extinction event the Earth has, has ever experienced. We do have parks and preserves, which, by the way, were established because they were pretty places. They were pretty places for humans to play in. They were not established for, for uh, you know, ecosystem sustainability or to prevent biodiversity loss. Now, they're working at that, too. Only 12% of the country is formally protected in parks and preserves, which means 88% is not. So if we're going to stop the decline of birds, we've lost 3 billion birds, breeding birds in the last 50 years in wow. the U.S. We've got global insect decline. We've lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet, and they are the little things that run the world. Um, so these are, these are serious losses that need to be not just stopped but reversed. And the only way that's going to happen is to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on private land. 78% of the country is privately owned. 85% of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So um, chances are real, real good that you own a piece of property that needs to be um, improved in terms of ecosystem function. And if we do enough of that in between the parks and preserves, then we've built biological corridors. The problem with, with small preserved areas is that they are small. It means the populations within them are tiny. Now, all populations fluctuate. Good times that go up, bad times that go down. If you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, often in your down cycle, you hit, you hit zero. You blink out of that little habitat patch, and then you're gone. And if you don't recolonize, you're permanently gone, and that's called local extinction. So the, the real problem, I mean, we look at, we look at, we use extinction as a metric of, of a problem, and it certainly is a metric of a problem, but it's, if we only address an issue when something's going extinct, that's, that's like only going to the doctors when you're dead. You know, we, we need to address the issue when you have common species that are steeply declining. And, and if you look around, that's what's, what's happening all over the place. Because it's the common species that are actually running the ecosystems. It's not the rare ones, not the ones with five individuals left. Um, and our, our uh, conservation model of having these little parks, isolated parks and preserves, guarantees that all the populations are, are small locally. So that's, that's why you can't say nature's happy over there. And it, you know, that does reflect our past model of, of um, segregation. Humans here, nature someplace else. That's not going to work. You know, E.O. Wilson says we need to save half of planet Earth. We have to have functioning ecosystems. We have to have nature on half of planet Earth, or we're going to lose life on all of planet Earth. Pretty serious statement. Well, half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we've got 8 billion people with all of our detritus and roadways and airports in the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So the only way we're going to do this is to um, find ways for humans and nature to coexist, to have nature happy where there are a lot of humans, and that means in your yard too. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, that, that statement that we need half of planet Earth for nature, like that doesn't sound very radical at all, you know? Like, it sounds like it should be, like, wait, we have less than half that isn't nature? And, like, that already is such an alarming statement that we're at that point, you know? So I'm kind of curious, how do we break through to, like, mainstream culture with this kind of information? I mean, you put out this wonderful book uh, that is apparently doing very well, but there's still so many people who don't even read books, you know? Like, how do we inspire them to step into this and to really feel the effect of what it means to have like ecosystem collapse it seems so yeah. distant for so many people and then when it happens then it, it there's no going yeah. back this is the challenge we're talking about changing our culture i mean this is why i've been lecturing about this and writing books and doing podcasts and everything else for you know almost 20 years now i do see the needle the needle moving um more and more people are interested headlines. So you know, when you get the New York Times carrying a headline that we've lost 3 billion birds and the Washington Post says we've got global insect decline. I didn't think anybody would care about that, but I was wrong. People do care about that. They're upset. The big disconnect is that they don't think they can do anything about it, mm -hmm. but they can do a lot of things about it. They can shrink their lawn. 
They can they can use what I call keystone plants. Just four, fourteen percent of our native plants are are supporting. Um, they're providing the energy for for uh, ninety percent of the food that's that's developed out there. So we want to use those those fourteen percent. Those are the keystone plants, and that's what you can find on that website. Um, you know, our our uh, light pollution at night is one of the major drivers of insect decline. So it's easy to address that. You can turn your lights out, and if you don't want to do that, you can put in a yellow bulb, which doesn't attract nocturnal insects. These are easy fixes that everybody could do, and it wouldn't cost a lot of money. Um, we've got we've got mosquito fogging companies, Mosquito Joe, and other things running around the country, killing all the insects as fast as they can. This makes no sense in a world with global insect decline, um, and. This fogging, the fogging does not control mosquitoes. So it's, it's all for nothing, an expensive nothing. And that's because you don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. And we can do that effectively with, with um, biocontrol, Bacillus thuringiensis, mosquito dunks, something everybody can do. Fire Mosquito Joe and get your own mosquito dunks. And you can control your mosquito populations without killing all of the pollinators, the monarchs, and, and everything else that drives our ecosystems. Yeah. Um, we can stop buying invasive plants. You know, 80, 86 percent of the plants of the serious woody invasive plants in North America are escapees from our garden. Mm. Wow. We've created this situation. So you look at the window at your tree and it turns out to be a calorie pear or a Bradford pear, major invasive species. That's why that's why I can drive from New York City to Richmond, Virginia in the spring, and it is white up and down the road um, as far as I can see. Those are escape Bradford pears that have, have pushed the productive plants out, and you've got this, this Asian plant, which is, is uh, it's kind of, I call, call it ecological tumors that are castrating our, our local ecosystems. Oh my God, that is... There are, you know, there, yeah. there are three kinds of plants. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs. There are plants that do not contribute energy. And there are plants that detract energy from it. So the contributors would be something like an oak. They're the best keystone plant in the entire country. A, a uh, non-contributor would be something like a, a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Uh, it's not invasive, but nothing eats. It's not not contributing any energy. Uh, and then that calorie pear or burning bush or barberry or porcelain berry or autumn olive or all of these. I'm yeah. going cola. Well, sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> it is life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. The non-contributors, yeah, the... the uh, mm -hmm these invasive plants that are, are um, pushing out the contributing plants. And, and you, I, you know, I don't know where you live, but invasive plants are a serious, serious problem all over the country. Um, it's, you can't find one of those little isolated habitat patches that isn't seriously invaded with, with plants from Asia. So the, the local park right down the street from, from uh, me here in Newark, Delaware, uh, is White Clay Creek State Park, and 30% of the plants in that park are, are from Asia. So you've reduced the productivity of that park by 30% right away because those plants aren't contributing anything. Um, so that's another thing that the homeowner can do. Remove the invasive plants that are on your property. If, if, if that tree is an invasive tree, replace it with a, one that's not, with a good native that's going to support the food web. So there are lots of things that individual homeowners can do that will make a huge difference. So um, I have had the fortunate situation of watching uh, my roommate who owns this house. She uh, attended a conference. It wasn't by you, but it was by someone who is a proponent of your work. And she's the one who got me turned on to this book. Um, and she took a lot of these principles and just ran with it. Um, we had like a no mow May where we just didn't mow the lawn. That was like a start. But then she started planting a lot of these keystone plants that you were talking about. And... I'll be honest, at first, my immediate response, like we we're letting the lawn go, and I'm just like, I don't know, is this, yeah, you're taking the reins. But as I sat out there every morning with my coffee and I'd be journaling, the amount of life that I started to see was like, it got my mind to kind of like stop spinning. And I was able to really just connect with the fact that 
this human space is not separate from nature. And just that moment of connection and watching that every day, watching the, the season change and watching new visitors to our um, new garden space, it, it really was um, deepening for my relationship to just this one little space that we call our yard. You know, and I just, you know, want to advocate for folks who are listening that like, you know, we're saying all these things and like, this process is one of also, it feels like of discovery, like taking an inventory of the plants that are in your yard is like actually a really rewarding thing. And it's like getting to know the history, like, oh, this plant wasn't here 50 years ago. Like we imported this. And yeah, I just wanted to just share that. Um, having actually watched it, you know, I can really advocate for the richness that comes from this kind of work that you're sharing. Well, I think you bring up an important point. How are we going to get people to buy into this? We have to do it in a culturally acceptable way. I want you to be able to walk out there with your coffee and not go through culture shock because the, the lawn's not mowed. What I want to do is reduce the area of, of lawn. So the lawn that is remains is mowed, it's manicured, it fits in with, with the current culture. But, you know, we've got 44 million acres of lawn right now. That's an area the size of New England, which doesn't do any of the 44 things that I talked about. It's not supporting pollinators. It's not sequestering carbon. It's, it's wrecking the watershed, uh, and it's certainly not supporting a food web. So if we reduce the area of lawn to the places where we walk, it becomes a cue for care. It shows that your, your neighbors that, you know, you get it. you got to keep the lawn mowed. You're, you're part of the culture. But you're going to have more more trees, um, and and you will be able to sit out there, not feel embarrassed in front of your neighbors, and enjoy all that that wildlife at the same time. That's the direction we want to go. Mm. Do you know uh, this might be a little off tangent, but like, how did we get to this like cultural standard of having a lawn and like the status symbol? Like, what do you know anything about that? It's goofy. Yeah, right? yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting story. You know, of course, we humans. Um, always have status symbols. We, we, we rank ourselves. We've got high status and low status people. Uh, we copied the status symbol that was common in Europe when uh, colonists came over. The European aristocracy could afford to have big lawns. Uh, either they owned enough slaves to take care of those lawns or, or, you know, not that many slaves in Europe, but what they had was enough sheep that could keep them um, trimmed and it was also a statement that they did not have to use every square inch of their land for agriculture. They were wealthy enough that you know they could they could waste acres and acres on a, a green patch that did nothing but look nice. It it was you know it was a sign of wealth. So you know, yeah. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and all the all of our leaders copied that because they were high status as well. But it was a, it, the the constraint was you really did have to be wealthy in order to have a, a nice lawn until we invented the lawnmower, and then any any poor slob could have a, a lawn. And then of course um, we invented lawn products to keep it that way, and marketing took over. So in the fifties, if you didn't have a perfect lawn, you were a communist. I mean, this is this is marketing, and it worked really well. Uh, and still, listen to the commercials today. If you have a dandelion in your yard, you're not a good citizen. Your neighbor's going to hate you. So we buy into this uh, to keep this, you know, this this crazy status symbol going. So I'm not. We're, we're not going to give up our status symbols, but we can change them. But the new status symbol could be, uh, you know, how many hummingbirds you have in your yard or something. And we're seeing it it change in the West with uh, the water issues that they have. We, there's not enough water for irrigated lawns in California or Arizona or Nevada. Um, so now the guy with the big lawn is the social pariah because people, know it's a terrible waste. We just can't afford to do that. There are state-sponsored programs to reduce your lawn. We're going to give you $3 per square foot rebate if you get rid of your lawn and replace it with xeric plants in California. That makes it socially acceptable, uh, and it forces people to adopt different status symbols. I mean, the other, about a month ago, Kim Kardashian was called out in, I guess, Hollywood, wherever she lives, for snubbing the water water law. She's got the biggest uh, water bill in all of Hollywood. And, oh, my God. You know, all, talk about status. Well, this, this you know, people don't like that. The, yeah. These are, we're, we're, we have to live in a way that enforces the common good. 
Um, you know the expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. What happens on your yard does not stay in your yard. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. You know, if you, if you have three acres of lawn, you're not doing the four things we just talked about. You're destroying your neighbor's watershed. You're destroying the, the, the pollinator population that keeps our ecosystems going. Same thing with the food web. You're, you're, you're not contributing to climate change. As a matter of fact, you're adding to the problem because you got to mow that lawn and put you know, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere along with other pollutants all the time. So you're not being a good social citizen in terms of the immediate problems that are clobbering us these days. Um, that's not high status anymore. So that's what's going to change our, our uh, relationship with the land around us. We've got to get to a place where the more nature you're living with, the higher status you are. And there, you know, there are high, high status people like uh, Leo DiCaprio and, and uh, some others who, who are helping in this regard because people follow what they do. So we are moving in, in the right direction. Yeah, I love everything that you just said. And, you know, I'm kind of curious, this is kind of a hypothetical. So say that this was taken on as a big movement and everybody here in the States was really on board and really educating themselves and their neighbors, but we still had the same kind of environmental regulations on corporations or lack of regulations, if you will. If they're still producing in the capacity that they are and with, with this kind of project, kind of like meet that or would we still have to kind of figure out a new way that we can produce goods and services and our energy system? Oh, you know, it's all tied together. Corporations don't get a pass on this. They don't, they don't get a buy. They have the level of their responsibility um, is highly correlated with, with the degree to which they're impacting the environment. Uh, so, um, so they've got to play the game too. Uh, and, and if that takes some top-down regulation, and I'm sure it will, uh, but we can help regulate from the bottom up too, de depending on what products we, we buy. Um, you know, the, the millions of us that comprise the marketplace, we have a say. Uh, we have to stop being sheep and just do what they tell us. You know, we say, we're not gonna buy that product. And it's, this has happened in the past. Uh, you, I don't even know if you were born yet, but um, there was a big problem with, uh, with the fishing industry that they were killing dolphins. It was the tuna industry. You know, they'd net tunas and dolphins would get caught in the net and, and they'd, they'd drown. Well, somebody snuck a camera on board one of these ships and they, and they filmed it. They made a, a, I don't even think it was a video, it was probably a, a film, and um, brought that to the public. That one film changed it overnight. There was such a public outcry against the, the tuna industry that people wouldn't buy, uh, I forget which company it was, but that kind of social pressure really can change things. And that's, that's what we have to bring to bear um, at the same time we have some top-down regulations. Yeah, that kind of almost resonates with me on like the idea of like losing our monarchs. That seems to be kind of a mm -hmm. rallying cry because I mean, it's just such a beloved, part of our planet and something everybody looks forward to, but oh, was it like 90% of them are gone now? Is it depends on where you are. In, in California, 99.9% .9 of oh them are God. gone. Uh, east of the Rockies, you know, they were just listed by the IUCN as an endangered species. Um, and there's one, well, there's two important causes, but, but one, you know, they've got to breed and they breed in North America and they require milkweeds to do that. Uh, and they used to breed largely on roadsides along agriculture throughout the Midwest and, and you know, the agriculture areas of the East because the plants next to the, the cornfield and the soybean, fe soybean fields were, they were weeds. It was milkweed, it was asters, it was goldenrod, it was all the native plants that supported not only the monarch, but also our, the 4,000 species of native bees that we have. Then we invented Roundup Ready corn and soybeans so the, the grower could spray right up to the road, kill all the weeds, and then replace it with lawn. So now you drive, you drive around anywhere, Illinois, all these other places, and the side of the cornfield is mowed lawn. So not only did we get rid of the productive plants that supported the monarch, uh, we replaced it with an unproductive plant that needs to be mowed periodically. Oh, Why? Actually, it's sanity. <laughs> 
<laughs> because that, you know, that's the new agricultural ethic. It's, it's, yeah, insane ethics. So we can turn that around. We can turn that around almost overnight. That's, that's the personal responsibility of that, that farmer, that grower, to put those native plants back. Uh, and if we do, we can, we can solve one of the huge problems that monarchs have. They will have enough milkweeds. The other problem is they've got to be able to overwinter in Mexico. Mm. And the, the mafia down there keeps cutting down the forest, the, the one forest that they require. So that's another big problem. But we can at least do our, our uh, job up on, on this. And a lot of, you know, the public is responding. They're all putting milkweeds in their yards and want to save the monarch. But we can save it big time by get, getting rid of the crazy lawn on our roadsides. So yeah. Yeah. It's just not necessary. So you kind of mentioned um, goldenrod, aster, milkweed. Um, are these kind of some of those keystone plants that you were referencing? They are. Yeah, they are. The goldenrod, asters, perennial sunflowers, evening primrose, those are the, the top four um, herbaceous plants in terms of supporting the caterpillars that drive the food web and the specialist bees that um, are you know, the heart of our, our pollinator community. The most powerful keystone plants are woody plants, so they're, they're trees and, and shrubs, and oaks lead the way there. Native cherries, native willows, birches, hickories, the trees you commonly find in a, in a typical forest. They're, they're the keystone plants. So for example, oaks nationwide support uh, over 950 species of caterpillars. Just caterpillars. And caterpillars, no, they support everything else too, but, but caterpillars are really important because they're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So you can measure the health of an ecosystem by counting the number of caterpillar species in that ecosystem. I mean, good example would be uh, how birds reproduce. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. There's good data from chickadees. It takes 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one nest of a Carolina chickadee just to get them to the point where they leave the nest and then they keep eating caterpillars afterwards. So <clears throat> that's a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. Oh my God. One nest. So wow. if you want a breeding population of a lot of birds in your neighborhood, you got a lot of, have a lot of caterpillars. How many caterpillars is your calorie pair making? None. So <laughs> that's the difference. That's why plant choice matters so much. So it seems like one of the measures to tell, like if you take this work on, um, I'm sure that there's a lot of different variables you can keep checking to see if your work is actually effective or not. Like this is a measurable thing mm -hmm. that we can be doing. So um, the amount of caterpillars seems to be one. Are there other kind of ways you can tell whether or not you're actually successful at your intention? Well, probably the easiest measure would be how many breeding birds do you have in your yard? How many birds are actually reproducing in your yard? If you know anything about birds, you could you could measure migrate migratory stopovers. So how many migrants are stopping to feed as they move through your yard? Uh, you know they fly right by. There's nothing there. They will stop and eat as they go. Um, but if you have no migrants in your yard, that's that's an issue. You can look at the at the leaves on your plants. If there's nothing eaten out of them, if every leaf is whole and perfect. Uh, that's great from as far as a you know a, an aesthetic value goes, but ecologically that's a disaster. It means that none of the energy that plant has captured has been moved on, has been transferred to animals, and if you have no animals, you have no functioning ecosystem. So these are all measures you can easily take. You can sit there and look at your flowering plants and count count the species of bees, and I don't mean honeybees. Honeybees are introduced; they're for agriculture. It's great for that, but that's not a measure of the biodiversity that we need. So these are all ways that you can you can do this. Count the number of butterfly species. Lots of ways. Yeah, definitely seems like it takes just a greater degree of mindfulness of the space that we're in. Mm -hmm. And you know, mm -hmm. I feel like so much of like our American society, at least here in the U.S., um, there's just so much <laughs> momentum, and there's just such a disconnect from our bodies, which means we're disconnected from the space and the environment that we're in. So you know, the reason why I thought that. You know, talking with you fits with the themes of my show of kind of embodiment and increasing your vitality is like this is also a path of self-exploration because you're you're connecting with your senses in just such a new rich way and 
as a result, you're increasing biodiversity by really just entering into a more thorough relationship. You know, that's... Yeah, I, you know, the direction technology is going with the, you know, meta making the virtual reality, whatever you put on your head so that you can go to some other universe. I mean... It's, this is not real life, folks, and it's not what's going to going to uh, save us down the road. Go outside in a diverse ecosystem, and you can have a, a, a different reality that that is healthy. A lot of great data on how exposure to nature improves your health. It lowers your blood pressure. It lowers, reduces your your cortisol, your stress hormone, which means you do everything better. Um, you learn faster, fewer divorces, less crime. It's all good when you're exposed to nature. Um, I don't know if you're going to get that by the metaverse. Plug it in, yeah. I like that idea, though, that there's an entirely new universe just right in your backyard. Like, you just plant a few different plants and the amount of novelty that you can see throughout the year. And, you know, this year, more than other years, I've really, really felt the passing of the seasons. You know, I'm in Michigan grand rapids so we have a very distinct four seasons in the year and Mm -hmm. every transition you know i've just seen different faces and you know different insects different birds and just like really tuning into that has just been a a delight like i don't use that word very often but like it's been an actual there's something psychologically that feels very wholesome counter to what we read on our phones yeah and it's it's so dynamic. It changes every day. You can go out in your yard, and there is always the possibility you will see something you've never seen before. I have been counting the number of moss species that make a living at, at, uh, on our property now. Our property used to be mowed for hay. There was nothing there. We put a lot of plants back. Now, we've been there 22 years, but I've been, I've been photographing all the moss species I found, and I'm up to 1,199 species so oh far. I added God. three species this week. Whoa. And, and you know, so even after 22 years, I'm still discovering things I've, I've never seen before at our, our house. That, you know, that makes me feel good. It's just, it says this, this works. This restoration stuff really works. We're putting the world back together again. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it really breathes life into the idea of like stewardship. You know, I think we've really kind of lost touch with that sense of responsibility. And I don't really know at what point in our human development we've become so disconnected from that responsibility. You know, like, I don't know if it was like the dawn of agriculture or what it was. No, but... no it wasn't that. I mean, it depends on, on your culture. Our Western societies and our Asian societies don't teach that. But many indigenous societies do. You know, you were, you were born with this, you were taught a sense of obligation, as opposed to a sense of, of what your rights are. And that's just a difference in, in culture. So we've got to get that into the Western cultures too. We all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It's simple logic. We yeah. depend on nature. We've got to take care of it. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's so obvious people don't see it. Yeah, yeah. I think it was in your book that you were talking about the importance of educating the youth with it by not like it wasn't enough to just like take them on like a quick field trip and like all right you spend two hours because they're not actually accessing that like seasonal aware awareness of it that was your book right yeah i'm sure i talked about that but a lot of people have talked about that um and this is the value of having some part of nature where they live they can go outside when they're you know at their own time their own pace and become friends with the natural world alone yeah. you know, we've got to pull back in the parental supervision if we hover over our kids we're sending the message that this is dangerous mm-hmm. you should you should actually that's sending a message of fear yeah. our kids are the future stewards of the planet and if they're afraid of it if they don't know what stewardship is if they don't love stewarding they're going to be lousy stewards you can't yeah. afford any more of that so yeah and a well, two-hour field trip is not going to do that yeah, yeah. But what would you say? Because like there are actually, I mean, there are some dangers with nature, right? Like, what would you say to like that? Like, you get stung by a bee, or like, I don't mm-hmm. know, there's a rabid muskrat or something. I don't know. <laughs> I would say that um, I, you know, I. What what's the figure? Three hundred and seventy people are killed each year by toasters. 
What? <laughs> um, I forget what the figure is by pulling over uh, vending machines that fall on you. Flat screen TVs fall off the wall and crush babies. Um, cell phones, you know, selfies. You, you, you get hit by a car, you walk off a cliff or... or uh, those figures are so much higher than the dangerous by nature. You know how many people are killed by, by poisonous snakes each year, and that's an average over the last 10 years? Two. I guess two? I was going to say 17. I thought that was no. being... Two. Wow. Two. Um, the real danger is, I mean, life is not risk-free. We, we want it to be risk-free, but uh, the danger in your yard is nothing compared to driving at 80 miles an hour behind a tractor-trailer. There's real danger there. You, if something goes wrong, you're dead. Period. Mm -hmm. Not true in your yard. You know. Yes, right. occasionally yeah. something will happen. But if you, if you, we're just terrible at at risk evaluation. We worry about things that we shouldn't worry about, and we don't worry about things we should worry about. And that's because we drive all the time, so we feel like we can manage that risk. Well, manage the risk of going outside too. Yeah. And people say, "What if I get poison ivy?" What if you do? Then you're going to scratch for a while. I mean, this is not the end of the world. Learn what poison ivy looks like and don't touch it next time. Yeah. yeah. The time people get poison ivy is when they're trying to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Just leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I, I become an old curmudgeon sometimes. But. I mean, I'm 29 and I'm already there. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I feel like I was kind of blessed to be born when I was, which I was in 1993. So I was younger in the 90s and you know i think that was like i'm the last generation that had that experience of not having your cell phone with you mm. and like i i know what it's like to just like all right i'm gonna go out i don't have a parent watching me i'm gonna go to the state park up the road and have my experience of like meeting nature and i feel like that really informed who i am and set a lot of values in me like i feel like yeah. nature is just such a wonderful teacher and i think the slight like you, you could get hurt you know you could fall off of something you're climbing on or get stung by something but like that's such a important part of human development that we exactly. shouldn't try and insulate from exactly yeah yeah so i'm kind of curious for the the people who are not able to have yards who maybe live in the city mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you know i think about you know i'm in grand rapids michigan and people who live like the downtown area they have maybe like a small balcony. <laughs> you know, mm. what can they still participate in this? Is there something they can do to help? Yes, uh, and it's a great, great point you bring up because eighty-two percent of us live in cities these days. Uh, so we can't say, well, you don't, you don't get to play. You still have that responsibility to to good earth stewardship. There are two things you can do. You can put plants on your balcony. Um, uh, Container gardening is, uh, you know, it's it's a, a growing type of horticulture. Make them valuable native plants, and you can actually provide forage for our, our native bees, for that monarch who's migrating to, to Mexico. They will, they're very mobile, they will find it, and they will use those, those things. And if everybody in an apartment complex did that, it wouldn't be just a, a bunch of bricks. It would actually be, you know, a, a place that's providing valuable biological services. The other thing you can do, though, you know, if you live in an apartment, every every I live an hour south of Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia radio stations every Friday will say, "Well, here's what you can do this weekend." They're looking for ways to entertain everybody who lives in the city and doesn't have a yard or anything, to, and they list all these you know social events you can do, but you can volunteer to help somebody who does own property, land conservancies. Parks and preserves are all understaffed. They're all underfunded. They depend heavily on volunteers for managing all of the land that they own. Uh, so that is a great way to get outside and actually do all the things we just talked about. It just won't be your personal property, but it's still land that, that desperately needs to be managed. We, we humans now are gardening the world. We've changed everything. We've, you know, we've moved plants all over the world and created a huge invasive species problem. That requires a tremendous amount of, of labor-intensive management. But there are a lot of us, so we can do it. It's fun. It's a social event, uh, and it is for the common good. Yeah. 
So, you know, I think to really start rounding this conversation off, you know, we've shared a lot of ideas, there's been a lot of optimism shared, and I'm kind of curious about, you know, with your place in this part of your career, watching the world unfold as it is, seeing the political systems we're enmeshed in, and just kind of the looming future that we're all kind of feeling this, like, uncertainty. Um, do, do you think, uh, you know, with the education that you have, do you think we have some hope? <laughs> I do. Uh, yes, I, I do. But it's up to us. It's not going to fix itself. Every one of these problems are problems that we have created, which means we have the wherewithal to, to uh, fix them. We have to recognize that they're problems. You know, denying that they exist is not going to get us anywhere. Um, you know, climate change is a huge and growing problem because we continue to exacerbate it and refuse to address it. Uh, but it's not that it's it's impossible to address. We just have to get serious about it. Uh, that's why I focus more on the biodiversity crisis than than climate change. It's it's more doable. It's something that everybody can do and see a result in. You know, climate change. You can stop driving your your SUV, but you're not going to see a difference tomorrow when you do that. If you plant an oak tree in your yard, you will see a difference tomorrow. And, and that's, you know, that positive uh, reinforcement really keeps you, you going. That's, that's what gives me hope. When I measure that 1,199 moths on my property, I say, that's a lot of bird food. We've recorded 60 species of birds that are breeding there now. They weren't breeding there when it was mowed for hay. Um, so that's a positive response that, that, that you know, I can I can sink my teeth into and say, this is worth doing. I should talk to other people and get them to do it too. And of course, all of that, we put a whole bunch of plants back. They're absorbing carbon. They're helping with, with the uh, climate crisis as well. Um, I don't want to end in a, on a bad note. You can you can edit this out though, but there's, there's another thing that we really need to address. And that is the earth is finite. It's not growing. So endless population growth, endless economic growth is, is the road to doom. We do not have endless resources and we can breed ourselves right off the planet. Do we have the, the ability to control our populations? Of course we do. Can you determine how many kids you're gonna have? I bet you can, I did. <laughs> you just have to, have to take it seriously though. Um, so there's nothing that's sustainable on this planet if we continue to grow in an unsustainable way. Yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't say I don't want to imply that growth is always sustainable. It's not. I mean, we're going to have to find no growth uh, economic models. Um, switch from from, you know, to to service dominated ecosystems. I mean, uh, economies. We can do this. People talk about it all the time. But uh, right now the only measure of success from every country is growth. Mhm. Mm can't do that for very long. We're yeah. way over the carrying capacity as it is now. It, to sustain the amount of the, the lifestyle that we have, that we all aspire to on this planet would take three and a half Earths right now. Wow. And last time I measured it was only one Earth. So, yeah. so that's, you know, that's, and of course, every time you add a new person to the planet, you're exacerbating climate change because that's more carbon being pumped in. And we never hear about that as a solution to, to climate change, is reducing the population. Yeah. It's so, not just yeah, like big the, challenge. Big yeah. challenge. It almost seems more far-fetched to be able to fix than the climate change itself. It's like we really do have to like rethink our economic structure. Like how mm. do we even begin? You know, that's yeah, I don't know if it'll even be in my lifetime, you know, but it, you know what? It will be in your lifetime. Yeah, you think so? Yeah, yeah. because we're at, we're at the edge that way. Yeah. We cannot go another another sixty years uh, with the perpetual growth model. Not going to work. Yeah, there's there's not enough resources. I mean, you and you can see, you can see the issues. You know, what are our major political problems right now? We talk about nativism. We talk about you know people protecting their territories. Why? Because of this migration pressure. All the countries are feeling it. Africa's collapsing, so everybody wants to go to Europe. So Europe tightens up their borders. No, we don't want you. And, you know, so we don't call it a climate crisis. We don't call it an environmental crisis, but those are the roots of it. We have more people than the planet can support, and they all want to go to the countries that, that have the resources still. And I don't blame them. 
but that's that's not a, a sustainable future. So, so we are seeing the results right now. Uh, it's not going to keep going this way for another 60 years for sure. Yeah, I do have a sense of optimism and like human ingenuity and that we're very responsive creatures. You know, it's really hard for us to like look 30 years in the future, but when something's knocking on our door, we typically, I mean, I, I have faith that we have the combined knowledge and expertise to respond to things well, uh, but like the amount of suffering we can avoid if we just do these small things every and just try and like tilt the ship 15 degrees rather than needing mm -hmm a 90 degree shift, you mm -hmm. know, to avoid the iceberg. Yeah, uh, a good way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think that's a way to end it on a somewhat more positive <laughs> note. We're responsive, <laughs> if not <laughs> anything else. Well, well, you know, just just to end the climate or the population discussion, if everybody had two kids, uh, it would stop population growth and eventually actually reduce it. Um, it, it that's that's very doable. Just say I'm going to only have two kids. We're not saying don't reproduce. Yeah, but just that's don't. that's a constraint that that would be easily met. Yeah, yeah. There's, you know, I don't really know too much about the cultures that are proponents of having large families, but I do know there's religious structures that are really about having like six kids, and that's a part sure. of their yeah. manifest destiny. You know. And that worked when, when the planet was big enough to sustain perpetual growth, but it's not anymore. So yeah. the old ways aren't going to work anymore. So. Yeah. So how do we change that? That is the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, not to be too, I don't know if the word's highfalutin or too esoteric, but I think that we, there's a lot of answers to be gained from engaging with the work that you put out in this book. You know, and oh, I think that you. that's... I mean, not only just for the biodiversity, but like also just like how we change as human beings, you know, like I said, tuning into the transitions of the seasons and getting to know our natural environment. You know, like I said, like growing up, there's so many lessons to be learned by getting stung by the bee or, right. <laughs> you know, and I, I just think um, what we can do in today is stuff like this and just reconnect with our local environment and to create genuine, sustainable relationships you know, with our community. And so thank you for taking the time to come on today to write this book, to dedicate your life to conservationalism. Uh, it's a great service to everybody who comes into contact with it. Well, thanks for the chance. It's, it's always fun to do these things. Yeah. Awesome. So where can people find you? Where can people um, uh, get your book? Where do you have any other online offerings? Tell people how to Keep in touch. Um, we have uh, one thing we didn't talk about was is our nonprofit called Homegrown National Park. So you can go to homegrownnationalpark.org uh, and and learn how to join Homegrown National Park. It's free, but it you become part of the community that's actually putting the world back together again, like we just talked about. Uh, and that's that's we call it the Talamy Hub. I mean, that's where everything is. You can find out about books. Uh, you, you call Nature's Best Hope my, my last book, but it actually wasn't. I've got another one called uh, The Nature of Oaks, um, which came out last year. And um, that talks about all the life that is associated with, with oaks. It's, it's a, a fun read to, to increase the appreciation of that community that depends on that tree in your front yard. It's not just a decoration. So there's, there's that there. But uh, yeah, any questions you have would be on that website, homegrownnationalpark.org. Love it. Yeah, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't know that you had. I was just so immersed with this one. I was like 2018. Yeah, that has to be it. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again so much, Doug. Uh, I really appreciated this. And you know, we'll catch you the next time. Very good. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. All right, my friends, that was the episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way through until the end. I really appreciate you, and I'm sure Doug appreciates you as well. If you want to stay plugged in to what he has going on, which is something I thoroughly encourage you to do, head on over to homegrownnationalpark.org. There you can find a lot of resources on how to start beginning this kind of work in your life and how to transform your yard. I really, really suggest his book, Nature's Best Hope. He also has The Nature of Oaks, which released more recently. Uh, I haven't gotten around to it, but I am really invested in what he has going on, so I'm sure to this upcoming year. So I hope that you enjoyed the episode, and we will see you 
in another two weeks. We have a very booked schedule. Uh, I got about 10 folks coming on from all sorts of different backgrounds. I'm really excited to see where the show is going. So keep an eye out. There is much more 21CV going to be drip fed to you. So thank you so much for your support and we'll see you next time.